I am uh, Harrison Goodman. This is Jesus Can Be Meaningful on Social Media. All right. Uh, so uh, Jesus Can Be Meaningful on Social Media. The word here that, that uh, we want to obviously work with is our favorite Sunday school answer, Jesus, um, because that's, that's sort of what we're going to do here. But the other word that we're going to look at here is meaningful. Uh, when we talk about social media, there are sort of two approaches. You can do a strategic or a tactical approach. And what I mean by this is you can sort of do a, a day-to-day, minute-by-minute plan. So that's where you're going to be talking about algorithms, about what types of posts do well on what networks, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, And we can also do a strategic view, which is sort of a long-term plan, which is why are we here? Who are we and what is our purpose, plan, and message for this thing? Uh, Since we're going meaningful, you can kind of take a guess that we are going for a strategic approach to social media. In other words, what is the role of the church on the internet and uh, what uh, what gifts can we bring and give and deliver there? Um, I am uh, Pastor Harrison Goodman. I serve as the uh, content executive here at a national youth organization called Higher Things. Uh, My my partner, my good friend, my coworker, Rhonda Palazzari, is not here. She, She took ill right before uh, best practices. And so not only does she miss standing here with me, but she also misses churros and all of you. Um, So I'd ask that you would please remember her in in your prayers, uh, that that she would get to feeling better here real soon. Um, So uh, naturally, since this is uh, Rhonda's uh, part, uh, we're just going to pretend that she is doing it right about now. That was one minute. How uncomfortable is that? (laughs) This is how much an impact a single minute can make. This is what 60 seconds actually can do to a person. And so it's important to sort of recognize just how much we have at stake, even though we are talking about what would otherwise seem like so little. Uh, One minute, the average time of an Instagram reel uh, of something on TikTok that people will actually watch all the way through. One minute of time is enough to make an impact even uh, upon uh, anybody out there. So when we start to talk about who we are and why we are here, uh, one of the things that we get to do uh, wonderfully, wonderfully, wonderfully because of the internet is everybody gets to stop being a real person and turn into a statistic. It's fantastic. It's terrible. But we're going to break it down a little bit because by and large, the, t- 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 the statistics hold true. Uh, we break off into, into generations. And so, well, we have the boomers. Who are the boomers? They're, they're our parents. It's their fault. Everything is wrong. Yeah. Um, their, their job is to, to, well, ruin everything. Uh, somehow, Generation X is sort of skated by without causing any real problems or at least catching any real blame. I don't know how you guys did it, but, uh, you know, rock on. Underneath that, hi, uh, I'm a millennial. I know it's because of my job to complain about everything that the boomers did. And underneath them, we have Gen Z. Gen Z, uh, they are probably about age 12 to 22. They are just now entering the workforce. Uh, This is a generation that is wholly and completely raised on the internet. Um, This is is that that wonderful place where things have actually switched over so much that they will tell us how they switched over. Because I didn't think I was old until I started working with youth, uh, especially full time. And they reminded me that all of my stories about when I was their age are from back in the 1900s. Back in the 1900s, for example, we used to have this really, really weird thing. It was sort of like an iPad, uh, but you had to turn the page every time you wanted to see a new picture. It was called a magazine. Um, I found out that this was actually a foreign thing because I have a son who I remember taking to the doctor's office and while he's sitting there looking at this magazine this this ancient relic he's trying to zoom in on the pictures by pinching them it's just sort of naturally how we approach things and then we have generation alpha they are up and coming these are our confirmands these are age uh, well zero to about 12 right now so if you're a boomer hands up I'm real sorry but we're gonna go ahead and just glare at you a little bit 
All right, that's okay. Jesus loves you. Um, if you're Gen X and just skateboarding on through, high fives. All right. Hey, nice millennials. There we go. Gen Z, I see a few of you. All right. And we don't have any alphas here, which is good because I'm usually not well-behaved enough to teach children, even though it is my full-time calling. Um, When we talk about what we get to do, though, is we get to reach now all of you, all at once, in minute chunks at a time. Sermons are anywhere between 15 and... uh, You get... 15. I preach like 12, and I get sick of myself. Um... You got some hidden 30 minutes, and you're thinking this is what actually needs to to sort of be done to make an impact. Uh, But this is just on our Sunday morning. What if we put out three one-minute videos seven days a week? That is 21 minutes. That is a chance to actually interact with our people in a meaningful way seven days of the week, because this is actually what we're supposed to be doing as the church, not just simply taking them in to, to like sort of re-energize for an hour a week and then saying, now go and do the real stuff, but actually continuing to uphold, forgive, comfort, and sustain them day to day throughout their lives and vocations as Christians. Uh, it's just that the internet is the internet. And so we're going to kind of break this thing off into to sort of three little bite-sized pieces. So uh, first, we're going to talk about what it is to be on the Internet. Then we're going to talk about why nobody likes to be on the Internet. And then we're going to talk about why you should be on the Internet anyway. So we're going to call this the digital age, the darkness, and the opportunities. Uh, we're going to sort of uh, do the opposite of what we just did for Rhonda's part. Uh, I, I get to do the other part now, but I'm going to actually say stuff. So we talked about, uh, well, we, we heard a minute of silence, just how impactful for one minute can be because like by the end of it I had to actually stop doing the bit and just stare at this empty thing because I was so uncomfortable being in front of you and you thought I had had a panic attack. (laughs) I'll do that later but now we're going to go a little bit quicker. So let's see if we can do this in a minute. Let's see. The digital age, there are 4.62 billion users on social media. That is half of the world's population. Half of the world's population is using the internet globally and daily. Daily, they spend about two and a half hours on the internet. 7.5 Different social media platforms are used every single month. Facebook is still sort of king, although nobody really likes it anymore. Everybody is still the one using it. And male to female pop, uh, population and breakdown really does matter. As we start to break down the digital age, roughly half of those people, 18 to 29, say they are almost constantly online. Almost constantly online. Almost constantly online. And by constantly, I mean over seven hours a day. They are spending on the internet. And if you want to complain about it while you watch Fox News, understand ages 55 to 64 years old are still on over five hours a day connected to the internet. This is just where we work, live, and play now. It is not just an American problem. See, this is the worldwide use of the internet. We're here right here about six and a half hours of use of internet a day as a world. The United States right about here. We're, we're, we're doing a little better than average, so you know, take that, I guess. Uh, the top websites and apps used every single uh, month. The chat messaging wins out. Social media, close second. After that, we'll finally start to see search engine, shopping, maps. E- music is just what I have playing all the time, and somehow we spend more time on social media than we do on my background noise. I just want you to consider that for just a second. As we break down the average hours and minutes that uh, users use social media each day, social media alone three hours for our youth still an hour and a half for our older folks the most used social platforms Facebook still king YouTube is coming and this is again a global thing so you're gonna have things that might not necessarily sound familiar but whatsapp is a worldwide chat phenomenon you're gonna have WeChat in China but you still have Instagram TikTok, messenger a whole bunch of stuff this is where we breathe and as we start to spend our time we can say our favorites are still by and large what we are using although you'll notice a couple of things sort of switch around because we're using things we don't even like to use we're so addicted to it that might just be something fun to think about uh, the percentage of internet users age 16 to 64 who watch each kind of video at least once a week. 92% of the internet watches YouTube at least once a week. Half of them music videos. You got your comedy, your memes, your TikToks, 35%. How to videos because I don't actually have father figures in my life so I'm going to ask YouTube to teach me how to change a light bulb. Here we go. All the way down to the bottom. Online uh, video is a source of learning. Half of our youth are using online video as a source of learning all on their own. So we get to see how they are learning. What are they learning from? First up, Google. Second up, YouTube. Then Facebook. And then, uh uh-oh, porn uh, taking over right there. We can even talk about how long they are spending on it. And then if you think about it a little bit, it'll sort of make sense that uh, porn, uh, about eight minutes. That's weird. Um, That was a minute. 
This is why getting bogged down in the tactical can be a little bit rough. That was a lot, right? What was the percentage of users who used WeChat? Do you remember? Meaning, though. What, what meaning did you take from that last minute? We're breathing, like I can feel the room calm down. I'm a little extra. What meaning can you take from all that numbers? We are overstimulated as a people. We're we are hyper literate. Good. What what other meaning can you take away from all of that vomit of information? Huh? It doesn't all stick. It's not going to stick, but you still get the feeling from it, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to talk about today. This is why, again, uh, we're not going to so much ta uh, chase a tactical approach. There are good resources here, and I would encourage you to take them up uh, on how to actually manage your times and videos for algorithms, posting times, things like that. The difference between posting at 3 p.m. and 3.01 p.m. can be 50% of your views, literally that much. The algorithm is king. But the problem with the algorithm is it's changing on a month-to-month, -month, sometimes a week-to-week -week basis, and you will always be chasing it. That is a full-time job, and if you are in any kind of full-time ministry, you need help. There's no way. Like, there's no way. So we're going to do a tactical uh, approach that is met by a strategic approach, a long-term view. Who are we? Who are we talking to, and why does it matter? And I'm anxious from reading that to you. I watched you start to feel anxious using, just listening to it. And then we get to talk about the fact that the Internet is a dark and scary place, that if it were a person, he would not be allowed to play with my son. But it is my full-time calling to make internet videos. So most of the time when we talk about the internet with our kids especially, it sort of begins and ends the same. It is something along the lines of, please don't take pictures of your downstairs, followed by a whole bunch of stories about other people who did terrible things on the internet and why it is a scary place. Um, and more often than not, one of the things that starts to happen is we blame the media. We blame the internet. We blame the social network. We blame Instagram for bullying. We blame Facebook for my addiction to it. We blame YouTube for uh, my short attention span, even though my fifth grade teacher would have told you I had ADHD a long time before that. One of the things that I think is sort of important to remember is first, yes, there are actually evil parts on the internet. There are places that are, are malicious and, and intentionally malicious. And, and no, you, you, you just you should not go to there. But maybe one of the things to recognize is that there were people who were sinners even before they ever went online. As it turns out, uh, folks were sinners just living in the moment long before the internet came along and connected us. Uh, what the internet is good at doing is just letting us talk to each other very quickly across any old distance. So that means then that the same problems are going to exist both online and offline. When it comes to ministry, the same questions exist, the same answers exist both online and offline. And so the internet looks like it does because, well, we're using them. We're, we're the people online. The internet looks like a dark and scary place because who are we? We're, we're dark and scary people. I, I can tell because I have 10 very simple commandments that would make my life go really, really simple if I would just, you know, follow them. But they actually apply both on the internet and off of the internet. Um, I can tell how things are supposed to be because the commandments actually stand in both places. So when we talk about the places, let's talk about them as, as simply that. I am not somehow more or less sinful based on what location I am standing in. So like I'm still a sinner in the sanctuary, right? So, so when I'm like, I'm thinking about tacos instead of church when I'm in the sanctuary, still a sinner, still need some Jesus. And when you're at home and you're scrolling at things that you would never ever admit to, you're a sinner there. The issue at hand is God's law, not the place where you're spending your time. That said, media is not neutral. Media is not neutral. And that doesn't mean that the internet is just a bad place, but that means that it's always going to start to reflect the, the character, the true character of the people using it. If you want to understand this, I'll give you an example. Back in the 1900s, when I was a kid, uh, they had just come out with these, these fancy dancy computers and they came up with this awesome game called Math Blaster. <laughs> Math Blaster was a game that was, it was sort of like a video game except that it wasn't fun. Um, <laughs> but if you solved the equation, your little spaceman would blast an alien. 
media is not neutral. It's not just, I bet we can get kids to learn math. The thing we actually taught a whole generation is that math is so terrible that we need to make it look like a video game to make you even remotely interested in it. Okay, now let's do this with church. <laughs> I'm just saying, if you have to trick people into it, the only thing you're really saying is that church is so terrible that if I don't trick you into this, you're not going to be genuinely interested. When we approach the media then, we can be a little more honest. Math Blaster doesn't really exist anymore because like, you're just going to have to learn math, dude. It's, it's, it's important. I'm sorry. You're, you're dumb, but you're going to have to sit through this anyway, and that was what my teacher should have told me. <laughs> and in the same way, when we go on there, we say, we have, you have real questions. We have real answers. We have real hope. We have concrete peace that is Christ who is crucified for sinners and risen from the grave. We can actually answer the questions in such a profound way that the rest of the world cannot, that we want to talk about that. Media is not neutral, so how you use it must be intentional. It cannot simply be, this is a brand new toy, let's play with it. It cannot simply be, everybody else is there, let's go there too. And it cannot simply be, I don't really like talking to people, so maybe I'll just post some stuff online. Maybe the screen will do it for me, like my math teacher. That's the reason I'm a pastor, I can't do math. It's just not going to work. Intentional use of a platform. Awesome. Sounds simple, right? Except now, let's talk about the things that actually exist on TikTok. You laugh, but this is an algorithm. So it looks at the things that you keep watching and it gives you more of it. So if your TikTok looks gross, it's because you look too long. Stop. Repent. Um, that's, that's just what it is. Um, but we also recognize that there's a lot of stuff out there. We are looking to make intentional, good use of a platform that has already been corrupted just by having other influencers and other sinners on it. Plus, I'm a sinner myself. It's going to be tricky. And so it's usually easier to talk about this in terms of, of retreat. It, it's actually not a, a new concept. Uh, there were these things called monasteries way back when. And you know why the monasteries came into existence? The world is gross. There's a lot of sin out there. There's a lot of suffering. It would be easier to retreat. It would be easier to not have to confront these things all the time and we could just pray. And it was with the very best of intentions that awful, awful things started happening. Uh, Luther did not like monasteries. He wrote, there are on record examples of men who forsaking marriage and the administration of the commonwealth have hid themselves in monasteries. This they called fleeing from the world and seeking a kind of life which would be more pleasing to God. Neither did they see that God ought to be served in those commandments which he himself has given and not in the commandments devised by men. In other words, being a husband is hard. You know what's easier? I'll just, she'll figure it out. Jesus, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to worry about Jesus because he can't sin against me. Except then you put a whole bunch of sinners in the monastery all the time. And as it turns out, they're still sinners in the monastery and they did awful things. It's easier to retreat and write the whole thing off. Because there we get to dodge the shape of the Ten Commandments, which is called our vocation. So love actually looks like something. We recognize this. So where God so loved the world that he... It actually has a shape. It has a substance. It has a form to it. Love is not simply an emotion, because Jesus probably didn't have the tingly winglies when he was dying on the cross for me. But rather, love had an action. Love also still has an action. When you're told to love your neighbor, it looks like the second table of the law. It looks like all of those commandments. And it's even that, even more, shaped by your vocation. So the way honor your father and mother looks is different if you're the parent or the kid, right? Now you go online. What are you? Huh. Okay. See, when we try to retreat from these vocations, it, it makes love sound simpler because then I just, I'm just going to pray and that sounds good. But what about the people that God actually commanded me to serve, commanded me to care for? And we do this in two camps, oddly enough, when it comes to the internet. We made monasteries all over again. On one hand, you have the camp that refuses to have anything to do with online ministry in any capacity because there's sinners out there and that's a gross place. Do you see the kinds of things that they're doing out there? And on the other hand, you actually have the people who have formed their own digital monasteries who don't even want to come into your church at all 
because there's sinners in there. So we're just going to keep talking to each other on here, and we're just going to find a way to wall ourselves off from all the other sinners. And in both cases, oddly enough, you kind of end up in the exact same boat because the internet is not the problem. It's just a place to talk to each other. The idea is that if you can come up with a better way to serve God than the places where he has given you commandments, love your neighbor in this way, vocations, love these people in this way, then all of a sudden the retreat is only going to put you alone with yourself and other people just like you, and you're going to be a sinner like them. Retreating from the world to the internet will not change your ministry because there's still sinners who still need Jesus. And in the same way, avoiding the internet altogether because it's gross on there doesn't actually serve your neighbor if that's where your neighbor spends seven and a half hours a day. How many of you guys are worried about how many kids will be in church in the next 10 to 20 to 30 years? Seven and a half hours a day. Just, you saw how painful it was to sit through a minute of silence. Maybe we could fill it with something good. When we talk about this, we get to talk about what the internet looks like and what the church looks like on it. And to do that, the best place in the world to start is not the internet, but it's, it's your heart. I'm going to read to you Matthew 15. Jesus called the people and said to them, Hear and understand, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. The disciples then came and said to Jesus, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? And he answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Leave them alone. They're blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, will they not both fall into a pit? But Peter then said, Explain this parable to us. And he said, Are you still also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this is what defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands, it does not defile anyone. So what goes into the mouth does not defile, but what comes out of the heart. And usually this is sort of used to explain, I can do this stuff anyway because I'm already a sinner. So like, guys, it doesn't really matter if I have this fourth plate of bacon. Um, after all, it tastes real good. Churros are fantastic, guys. Um, this is not the question. It, it's rather a recognition that your sins affect others. What comes out of your heart? Your heart. Your heart. Your, your, your feelings are... Murder, adultery, sexual immorality, slander, false witness, theft. Do those cause harm? You guys want to get more or less murdered today? Big fan of less. So when you put a whole bunch of sinners in a place where they can interact with each other, surprise, they sin. This is then about where you are rooted. And this is about how we approach social media. I'm going to read to you Ezekiel chapter 36. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all of the countries and I will bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. From your idols I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove your heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my statutes. You shall dwell in the land that I give to your fathers. You will be my people and I will be your God. What happens first in Ezekiel? Is this about what the people have chosen or about the identity they've been given? I will take you from the nations and I will gather you from all of the countries and I will bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean from all your uncleanness. Then you will start to be careful to obey my commandments. What comes first? Identity. identity. The identity shapes everything. This is about a rooted identity in the Lord before it can be anything else. You shall be my people. I will be your God. You guys are with me now. And that shapes how we start to deal with the rest because, well, the problem is not online. And then the solution cannot simply be behave. If behave is the sum message of Christianity, either online or off, it should be a pamphlet and not a church. Like honestly, they, they fit it on two big rocks and they carried them down from the mountain. This is really pretty simple stuff, you guys. Just knock it off. But the problem is, once sinners have grabbed hold of these, 
it does stuff to us. And it's actually worse in faith. What I mean by in the world, if you're just going to be a good old sinner, just be a good old sinner and like, don't worry about it. But now you are a Christian who loves the Lord, but why do you keep sinning? It, it, it will wreck a person, especially if all they have on their heart is some sort of message of morality. I, I know this because Paul, who is one of the most eloquent men of all of history, wrote, you know, love is patient, love is kind, it's beautiful stuff. Paul, when he's left to sort of think about himself with his own sin, he starts like, he's, he's like ranting to himself like a crazy person drawn on a wall with a crayon in Romans chapter 7. I'm going to read this to you. I'm going to read this at the speed that I feel more comfortable talking at, so, you know, saddle up. Um... Here we go. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, and I agree with the law that it is good, so no longer I who do it, but it is sin that dwells within me, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out, for I do not do the good that I want, but the evil that I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me, so I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand, for I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind that I am making me captive to a law of sin that dwells in my members, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is that back and forth of every Christian. I want to do good. I want to be better. But I wake up the same kind of sinner who really likes sinning. Like, likes sinning. And so Paul, as he goes back and forth and back and forth, he finally throws the whole mess up in the air. He says, who's going to save me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. We bear two warring desires, online or offline, And so our hope then, our hope is always rooted in the gospel. Sanctification is a fancy church word that if you say it in front of your pastor, he will like you a little bit and make him happy. But it really just means made holy. Like you find the word saint in there. It's being made a saint. So we're not Roman Catholics here. And so we know we're not a saint by doing three miracles documented in history and then doing enough good in this world that we add to the treasury of merit that the Pope can sell you for a, a, a cheap fee. Instead, a saint is a holy one, are baptized the believers. My name is Saint Harrison. I know that even though I'm a sinner, I'll see you up there. I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be simpler. Hebrews 10. By that, namely God's will, we have been made holy through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. How are we made holy? Through Jesus Jesus Christ. What should we be talking about then? Yeah, it changes the whole thing. Because like we have Ephesians chapter 5, which makes everybody uncomfortable because it talks about marriage and how men and women relate to each other. And like everybody somehow gets really worried about like 1950s misogyny. And so we're like, no, all right, like, let's just temper this. Except if we actually go looking for what it's about, it, it gets simpler. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might make her holy, having cleansed her by the washing of water in the word so that he might present to the, the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she would be holy and without blemish. If your understanding of marriage, by the way, is anything different than Jesus dying on the cross for the church, you're doing it wrong. There is no room for misogyny here. That's a sin. But you see how then when we actually get to interact with a world that is struggling with how men and women relate to each other, we might have something unique to say that isn't entirely rooted in the law. I know how it ought to be. The problem isn't how it ought to be. The problem is how it is. Can you in a minute speak just a little bit of hope that when these two people are warring against each other, we are presented to God without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. We are the baptized. We are the made holy ones, not because of our works, but because of his. Because if we're going to come down from the mountain only carrying the law, no matter what we sort of want to stick it on top of, uh, be it the internet or, or anything else, uh, we, we have a law. And the law always kind of does the same thing. The law always has three effects. There's the the curb, the mirror, and the guide. Your confirmation kids know this, right? Okay, so let's talk about this and how it applies online. Curb, mirror, and guide online. Because this is, by and large, how the internet works. I know it because it's how the world works. The world has the law. They're pretty good at it. In fact, sometimes I think they're better at it than us. They have simpler codes of conduct than us. Don't be mean. Don't be a hypocrite. My law's done. It's actually more efficient than mine. I have the gospel, though. But if all we have is the law, we have the curb, the mirror, and the guide. So the curb, you guys remember what the curb is for? Like, let's go way back to confirmation. It'll actually help us use the internet better, I promise you. What's the curb for? Do you remember? Keeps us in line. Yeah, it stops us from driving on the sidewalk. Killing Aunt May while she walks her dog. It's not okay. So, can you still drive on the sidewalk? 
It takes a little more effort, but the curb is there for it. The curb is this. It's that threat of punishment, either from a government or a rule, um, some authority figure, or just even from your conscience because you don't want to feel bad all the time. Uh, the curb really only works, though, if there can actually be punishment and shame. The internet, though, is by and large, especially if you want it to be, anonymous. Can there be punishment, then, for all the things that I say online? How many of you guys have ever had some real fun comments in your sections there? <laughs> no curb. Okay. So, online gets to be a little bit reckless. It gets to be a little bit like the Wild West, because like, if you can't get in trouble, you don't actually have to look into the eye of the person that you're talking to, because you would never actually say that if you were face-to-face -face with them, but I'll sure type it. You're going to be dealing with a thing. When you want to outlaw somebody, well, the Pharisees tried it with Jesus. How'd it go? Is this the role of the church? Then there is the mirror. What does the mirror do? It shows us our sin. The internet law will always accuse you too. It doesn't mean you can't be good, but it does mean you can't be good enough. And, well, that's on both sides of it. Which is why, you know, it's one of those things where if you work in any form of social media with your church actually talking your statistics in real life without embellishing them, it's a little embarrassing. Because your church's 135 views and 6 likes isn't actually as uh, uplifting as you want to make it seem when it comes time to defend your, your position. Uh, if the problem remains, though, it is simply in this. If your whole identity is rolled up into this post or this comment, is it enough? Are you enough? Is this how we're going to do this? Because it's not who you are. This is important to sort of recognize because all of us are looking for an identity online. But if your identity online is, is how to sort of break out, how to go viral, wouldn't it be great if, if uh, one of our videos hit, you know, two million views? And I'm terrified of that because I'm terrified of the comments. But at the same time, like, how do you actually break through the noise? Because if every single one of us can post stuff online, who wins? Who breaks out? I'll go through my TikTok right now, and there are two kinds of people that will stand out, that will break through the noise. They are either really, really good at what they're doing, or really, really bad at what they're doing. Like, they are so awful that I just want to laugh at them. And if this is the message that we're conveying to our people about what Christian life is like, what does that leave them with? See, sanctification is about identity. This is actually the thing. You are made holy. How are you made holy? Through the washing and regeneration. How are you made holy? Yeah, you, your baptism. So I, am I enough then? How do I know this? I am baptized. Jesus says, I am enough. I am holy. I am worthy of love. I am literally worthy enough to rise from the grave on the last day and stand before the Almighty who not only knows my search history, but all the things I've thought about. And he'll say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I know this because I am baptized. That's who I am. That's who your people are. Is that what's conveyed? See, sanctification begins in identity, but the internet will remove it. And it will leave your whole identity wrapped up in, can you be like this? Which is why I want the stuff that is advertised to me on Instagram. It is why I want the prayer life that I see other people talking about. It is why I want the good behavior and the good family and the happy photos that come from all of it. When we as the church start to proclaim what it is that we as Christians look like out there, it is identity. So is your identity a baptism identity or a works identity? It is good, and it's one of those tricky things, because I recognize this. Like, if I actually showed you what my kitchen sink looked like, you would not be all that impressed with me as a person, because like, I don't scrub the stainless steel, and it doesn't shine. There's some bits of food in there. And like, but, but you can't take that picture on Instagram. You can't. But if I'm going to take the, the one that I'm going to make just for this... Like, we actually we did a challenge of what's in your refrigerator, and I was mortified. I was mortified. Because the whole staff had to show their refrigerator. And I was like, yeah, but there's stuff growing in there. Um, <laughs> you see the, the terror between reality and what we wish that it was. Do you see how based on the law it is? When we then start to talk about how to, to, make, to make use of this, I know I'm very clever with these pictures that I photoshopped. 
we'll go to the word of the Lord. When you pray, you must not like be the hypocrite. You must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and the street corners so that they would be seen by others. Truly, truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard in their many words. Don't be like them. For your father knows what you need before they ask him. Why do the Pharisees pray on the street corners? Attention. They liked being seen. It made them look and feel good. And the validation that they got from other people seeing them and recognizing this person has their life together spiritually. That was what motivated them to do it. It was the most arbitrary of laws that Jesus confronts them with. You recognize this, right? Go and pray in secret, and your Father who sees you in secret will reward you. Why pray in secret? You think... Huh? So he doesn't see you on the street corner? Like, that's where he's blind? You see what I'm saying? How about this? You guys are taught to pray not my Father who art in heaven, but... There is no individual prayer life then. You, you don't get to pray alone. You are not allowed to pray alone. Even if you by yourself go in the, the, the closet, shut the door, Jesus is praying with you. He sits at the right hand of the Father interceding. It's a Bible verse. I read it in there. When you pray, angels and archangels and all the company of heaven pray with you. So why secret? Because we're aiming at the wrong thing. And this is a chance to reset. See, prayer is not about how you look. Prayer is not even about getting stuff. Prayer is chiefly about comfort. The reason that we pray is for comfort. Do you think that God sits in heaven and is like, you know, I really only get out of bed for like a hundred shares anymore. Like, I, I know that Timmy has cancer and that's a drag, but if you guys aren't going to like it and share it, I'm not going to help. Is that how prayer works? No. Like, we make fun of the Roman Catholics for praying to saints. So only our saints are just online. Like, we, we're like, oh, they can't say, St. Anthony, help me. But then we go to five little private groups and we say, would you guys pray for me? Like, our saints are somehow better than theirs. Why are you praying? Doesn't God love you enough to answer you all by yourself? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. I know this. I know this because I am baptized. I am his kid. I don't need all of my kids and then all of their friends to come and gang up on me so that I'll give my kid a glass of water. And I'm a sinner. How much less would your Father in Heaven avoid answering your prayers? Your catechism is helpful for this. I love this small catechism because it's the answer to like 90% of the questions we ever have in our entire life as Christians. They're sort of like summed up in something that we can teach to little kids. Uh, our, our catechism says, Our Father who art in heaven, what does this mean? With these words, God tenderly invites us to believe that he is our true father and that we are his true children. So with all boldness and confidence, we may ask him as dear children ask their dear father. Prayer is about comfort. You have a father in heaven who loves you, who has promised to care for you. Focus on this, not what you look like, not what you're saying not how many people are doing it with you, not even just in what you are getting from it. Prayer is chiefly about comfort because every last one of us has some things to be uncomfortable about. The Lord's Prayer is beautiful because it simply lays out all the reasons that we're losing sleep in a way that, that we can actually mark. God's kingdom feels far away. I feel cut off from him and his holy name. I am afraid for my daily bread. I have a lot of sins. There is evil down here. What do I do? And every single case, the catechism kind of points out, like, you guys know that God gives daily bread to people who never, ever prayed? He'll even give it to evil people. Why does he do that? Well, because he loves you. This is about receiving your daily bread with thanksgiving. What can you do to make God's kingdom come? Do you think he needs your permission for his will to be done? Do you think he's sitting up in heaven and is like, I would love to help you, but help me to help you. Help me to help you. No. He's real good at this job. It would be great if I would actually reflect on that for like half a minute, so I would be less anxious prayers for this. The, the life of prayer that we have, the, the beautiful aspect about it is that, well, I don't care. And God needs me to. He will insist that I do it so much that if I'm going to insist on doing it in front of other people, he'll say, no, go and do it by yourself. <coughs> it's helpful. Because comfort is not found in recognition from man, but identity from God. I don't know. I'm very clever. <laughs> I'm God's child. This is the extent of my prayer. I want to be wherever he is. That is the extent of my life. If you want to live by statistics, you will die by them. 
It, it, it's just the case. If you want to live by popularity, you will die by it. If you want to live by the law, you will die by it. So who are you? I am a child of God. And children have, as simple as it is to start with, bodies. Do you guys know what Gnosticism is? Have you heard about it? It was like the very first heresy. Like John, the, the, the Apostle John is writing against it in his own gospel. That's how quick it popped up. And Gnosticism is simply this, that like anything spiritual is good and anything of the flesh is bad. And so like, how do I hurry up and get to heaven because I keep sinning in this body? Wouldn't that be great? And then they just leaned on it and dialed it up to 100. What about on the internet? What kind of society do we have online? A bodied society or a bodiless society? How does God answer it? Think about your creed. Your creed is really helpful for this. The Apostles' Creed. You guys, you guys say it sometimes. What does God do? Is he bodiless or not? He is not bodiless. What does he do? My man, he takes on human flesh. He comes into my creation. He is bodied. He is located. And, and even just then, when I start to look at myself, when God made people and he said, this is very good, how is Adam? Was he a soul in heaven? He had a body. We are actually supposed to interact with each other in our bodies. You guys have just come out of a, a very, very traumatic time. Some of you have learned this stuff because of a very traumatic time. I don't even need to name what the very traumatic time is, and you all already know it. We all have sort of like PTSD just getting out of that place. Is there such a thing as an internet church? No. Like the simplest answer is no. There is not. We did our best to stop gap in the middle of COVID, but there is no replacement for actually being gathered together because we are the body of Christ and individually members of it. My pinky, as it turns out, does poorly apart from the rest of me. When we are cut off, it's going to shake a lot of stuff loose. The internet cannot replace your church. Your internet ministry cannot replace your church. It can point to it. It should point to it. But there's actually this, this thing that happens even before all of this stuff comes along. And that's just that you have a body because God made you that way. In the last day, you will have a resurrection. You don't even just hope for heaven, but I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. You will rise in your flesh, no longer corrupted by sin, to live forever with God and a new creation. I know because the God who took on human flesh died, rose to make me that way. And so, inside of our world today, it still works that way. When God wants to interact with us, he is not a spirit floating in a vacuum, but the Holy Spirit interacts with us through means. So I actually know he's there. So we, we, we say word and sacrament, right? And what that means is, I don't have to measure God by how full my heart feels. Which is important, because when I need God the most, my heart never feels very full. If God is just how full your heart is, when you need God the most, he's always the farthest away. But if I can say, I know he's in that font where I was baptized. I know he's in the word that is preached and prayed about and proclaimed. I know that he's in communion. That is his body and blood. I know where to find God now. So when I go online, what can I be? What can I do? Do you see that nobody wants to tackle it? See, here's the trick. It's not different. It's actually not different. Who am I when I go online? Yeah. I have the same name, the same baptism, the same value, the same resurrection, and even then, the same vocations. I am a father when I go online. I am a husband when I go online. I am a pastor when I go online. The way that I interact with people is still shaped by these things, and that's a gift because these are the ways that God has promised to work. It's, it's really, really helpful. See, we, I, we, we think if we can somehow shake the, the vocation, we can catch hold of people's attention who has never, ever actually heard the gospel yet, never, ever actually interacted with us. But the vocation is where God promises to do all the work, and, and that matters because I get to think about my mom and my dad. Were my mom and my dad perfect? <laughs> I, could, I could probably tell you some stories. Got some trauma, guys. Um, no, my mom and dad were sinners. Did God want to, even against their will, use them to raise me up in his word. I know that I was raised Jewish. My parents were actually set against this thing, and God thought that was cute. 
And he said, no, it's time. Here's the word. He worked through them, not only to teach me how to think, to teach me how to interact, to teach me how to do all the dumb stuff I did that eventually knocked me down to the point where Jesus could hold me. In all of it, God works through people because he wants to. Now I get to think about myself as a pastor. I am a terrible pastor. I am a sinner. Lord, have mercy on me. I don't know what I'm doing more often than not. I just try and talk fast enough that nobody will notice. (laughs) But God has said, open your mouth, I'll handle it. And he preaches. The gift of vocation isn't just, these are the ways you're supposed to love your neighbor and these are the people you're supposed to love, but these are the ways that God wants to see your neighbor loved and the promise is to use you to do it. Now, being a father is a gift because God wants to see those kids that he has given me raised up. And he's promised, I know that you're dumb and have no idea what to do, man, but I'm going to help you here. And the beauty of vocation is that somehow this thing works. Because then you can actually go through reality. Like, think about your childhood. Have you done enough stuff that it's surprising you're still alive? Okay, same. Um, Think about your spiritual life. Has there been enough sort of spiritual crises that it's kind of a miracle that you're here? Think about the church as a whole. From the days of martyrdom, through plague, through famine, through war, through suffering, through death, through heresy, through persecution. Is it a miracle that we're still here? Miracles are actually pretty, pretty easy to come by. Now when we go online, it's the same thing. God actually wants to use the church to proclaim the gospel. Chill. God actually wants to use pastors to preach DCEs to teach, lay people to love, all of these things. God has actually put you in a place where you get to speak with a unique voice simply because you are already tied together with them. Your vocations don't disappear or go away. God has promised to work through them. So they're the actual things that we get to lean into, and that that matters. Because when it comes to this thing, like especially, especially online, because there is no locality that is difficult to get to now. I understand why there needs to be a church in Nebraska and a church in Texas because you can't. you got to go somewhere on a Sunday morning. But if it's just like you can all go to the same YouTube channel and and watch the same sermon, right? (laughs) Why are you putting yours up if there are 8,000 other people doing it? And you have different people. Your people need you. I know this because you were sent there by God. You were given. And so when you are are interacting with your people online, God be praised for it. If it touches others, God be praised for that too. But the Holy Spirit will handle it. Simply be faithful. And he will handle all of the rest. Because that that faithfulness is where he has actually promised to work. And and in reality, um, it's even measurable. How quick do you think a Gen Z can pick up on the fact that it is a sponsored post on TikTok. How quick? Less than one second, they know. This is a sponsored post. Somebody paid to put this there. And this isn't even the tag at the bottom. They can do it by, t- by, by touch. That shot is a little too clean, man, no. That lighting, too good. That person, no. They should be uglier. Like, they, they can tell real quick. It's because, well, that authenticity that everybody's looking for, you actually already have it. You don't even need to manufacture it like all of the organizations and corporations out there do. You already have it. Go out there and love your people and recognize that through your vocations, God wants to work. And that's so powerful to see it happen that more people get sucked into it. You have real answers in a way that the world doesn't. The world has a simpler, a simpler moral code. I told you this, right? Be kind and don't be a hypocrite. It's very simple. Except, do you know what it actually means when you sort of look at the other side of the coin? Don't be a hypocrite sounds awesome. Because like nobody wants to be a hypocrite, except if you're not a hypocrite, it only means you don't believe in anything bigger than yourself. It's really easy to not be a hypocrite. Just be hopeless. I am as good as it gets, people. Feel better? No. The whole point of Christianity is I do believe in something bigger than myself. If I could perfectly demonstrate who my God is, my God sucks. I need a better God. Is your God bigger than you? Okay, let's talk about him. Let's talk about hope. And here God has actually promised to work, even through means, even through, through places where he has promised to gather us so that we are not alone simply wishing for it. But you get to point in your ministries to a place where this is really happening in real time and space. That there is a place for them to come and sit on a Sunday morning to hear this for them. Not just about people that might be like them, but for them, for you. It makes up all of the gospel. Those two little words are everything for you. 
And the internet can't actually give you anything, but your church can. So we point to it. Right? That, that's why if I look at sponsored pictures of food, I get hungry, but I can't actually eat it. Go to church. Take communion. Jesus is there. We have, we have places where the Holy Spirit actually wants to work. And Gnosticism hates it. Gnosticism thinks that the spirit is as good as it gets. The body is terrible. So it has to hate all the things the body does. Gnosticism hates motherhood and fatherhood. Gnosticism hates the church because it has, well, it has church workers. It has souls that actually love each other in concrete ways. And so we hate Gnosticism. Gnosticism is the worst because there it just leaves us feeling alone but pretending to be together. And that's what COVID did to us. We sat there alone pretending to be together across Zoom and it was the worst. Like it shook so many mental health things loose because we recognized that's not real. We are. You can answer that. You can actually proclaim hope and even where to find it. And that's why your church's social ministry matters. Because it's not just will you interact with people who might not have heard it, but it's can you point them to a place where they can really find it and live inside of it, receive from it day in and day out the things that they need to carry them through this valley of the shadow of death unto the glories of the life everlasting. And that is not simply about being right. And I know this because there's this awful, awful place on the internet. I think it might be worse than all those dirty sites. It's called Lutheran Internet. Lutheran Internet is where we fight about the stupidest things in the world and just call each other awful, awful things because you are not as Lutheran as me. You are not as Christian as me. And let's just take a time out and recognize this is a very important topic. It is a truly, truly profound distinction that there is a difference between helping and winning. What is winning about? Well done. What is helping about? I mean, really, yeah. It's, it feels better to win. It really does. But you've been called to help. If your idea of the internet is, how can I be right where other people are wrong? Be they a, a, pol a political organization? Be they a different denomination? Be they somebody inside of your own? Be they just the rest of the world? Understand where this is going to go. There is a difference between helping and winning. It's really, really easy to point out bad politics as bad politics. Who does that help? It's really, really easy to point out where somebody else is not as Christian as you. They know it too because they're a sinner. Is that actually helping? And then you get into the place where we argue about the stupid stuff that doesn't even matter at all. Like you have, um, I call it the apple guy. So, um, I'm going to get in trouble. Um, there is that person in every comment section who just wants to prove their one little point, no matter what you talk about. And so, like, you're talking about the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and uh, there's this one person in the comment section every time. It wasn't an apple. God never said it was an apple. Why do you always draw it as an apple? And you're like, dude, chill. Um, like, then, it, you're right. if it doesn't matter, then why are you making such a big deal about it? Is this about winning, or is this about helping? And, like, besides, I'm pretty sure it was a banana. Um, <laughs> it's true. I'm pretty sure it's a banana. Uh, I don't have any biblical evidence. It's just hard to eat one without looking like a sinner. Um, if, you, uh, if, if you didn't like that joke that was written by Rhonda Palazzari, <laughs> I'm just kidding. This is how we use the internet, though. There are guiding principles. Is the foundation of the thing you're about to do against the law of the Lord, the Ten Commandments, yes or no? If it is against the law of the Lord, don't do that thing. Very simple. And then... Is the use of the internet you are using it for against your vocation? Because there are things on the internet that are clearly wrong. There should not be dirty websites on the internet. We can all acknowledge that. There's a sixth commandment, thou shalt not. Now I can go on Amazon. Can I use Amazon in a good and godly way? Yes. Do I? Do I? I spend a lot of time buying stupid stuff that doesn't actually support me in my vocation. Let's go to your social media. Is the use of your social media, are you doing something that goes against the Ten Commandments? Don't do it. That's very simple. Now, who are you as Christians? Who are you inside of your vocation? Is this use promoting or taking away from your vocation? This, this actually does help guide us. It gives us also a tremendous amount of freedom because most of the things you thought of are like, well, yeah, of course it's inside of my vocation. Then you get to breathe and even recognize something more. If it's your vocation, God will bless it. If it's your voca vocation, God wants to, to work through it. And if it's your vocation, God has promised to, to sustain people because of it. There actually is no such thing as anonymity online. There's not. Because there actually is only one nameless accuser. What's his name? It's real simple once we clear that up. I know who's making those comments. 
I know who's posting that way. I know whose fake Twitter picture that actually belongs to. It's Satan. Let him have it. Christians are not anonymous because you are named in your baptism. This is who you are. And that also means we get to be very bold in what we do because ours is not to accuse, ours is to forgive. This is the job of the church. We forgive. We do it in the name of Jesus. The whole and sum of your online ministry is this. Where can I give sinners Jesus? How can I point them to Jesus? And then when we get into the tactical, the day-to-day -day stuff, the which algorithms to use and what time to post, it actually shapes it up again too. Because like then you get to go and, and deal with like just the simple tactical reality of TikTok. I know that if I post at 3 versus 305, our views will go up. Roughly 30 to 40 percent. Five minutes. It's very simple. That's going to change in who knows, whenever they feel like it. I also know that if I wanted to be a little bit more honest, this face is not going to do as well on TikTok as some of the other stuff you see on there. Is that a go against my vocation, though? Sell sex on TikTok for views? That's, that's not okay. All right, so what am I going to do? I'm going to proclaim hope. And I'm going to say the Lord will work with this. But I know that for the people that hear me, I know I'm pointing to Jesus. I know I'm pointing to the cross. I know I'm pointing to forgiveness. And I know I'm not going to get tangled up in any of the other things. It changes the world. You can sing Jesus loves me. You can sing I am baptized into Christ. You can do anything that you want, but it will not make people on the internet be any nicer to you. It's just the world. That's okay. Like that, that, that is. It, it, it changes the timeline. It changes the side of the crowd. Who are those that sing hymns? Who are those that sing spiritual songs? Who are those that sing praise to the Lord? When? From the days of Jesus until the last great one, you sing along with them every time. If the world doesn't like it or isn't interacting with it, chill. All of, the, all of salvation and, and everything that belongs to it is enthralled. God be praised for you. If you feel alone and cut off because you're trying to interact with people online who do feel alone, understand that our faith actually ties us together in a way that expands beyond the realms of even time itself. There is an identity spoken here that actually does collect us into something bigger than ourselves. And it's not just to feel a part of a crowd. The part of the crowd has actually done a lot of damage. That's that segregation we have online. That's that, that algorithm that will only put me in front of people that already think like me. And so I... Well, I, I come up with worse and worse arguments to defend my beliefs because nobody's questioning them anymore, not really. I become more and more hateful towards those who think different than me because I've never actually interacted with one, let alone looked them in the eye, which isn't helpful. It's a gift to, to sort of use your social media to point them to places where they're going to have to deal with people that are different than them. We talked about this at the very beginning. We did the generations, which like we can only sort of talk about each other in, in derogatory ways because millennials whine about stuff and boomers ruin everything. <laughs> But, but in reality, there's a gift to your social media in that it can drive them to a church where they will have to deal with people that are not like them. And that's a good thing. It will polish your arguments. It will help you increase in love. And it will help you recognize that Jesus is more for, than just for like, me and the things that are like me, but it's for all of the world. And all of this stuff, we, we have a Jesus who collects all of us together, lays all of our sins upon a cross, names all of us worthy of love. And this is the whole and sum of what we get to proclaim. In all of these things, um, it just turns into a gift again. Uh, the simplest thing is how do we begin? One bite at a time. There's an old Abraham Lincoln quote. Give me six hours to chop down a tree and I will spend the first four sharpening the axe. What does this mean? Expound upon this for me. Give me six hours to chop down a tree and I will spend the first four sharpening the axe. What does this mean? Preparation is key. If you sharpen the axe, how, is easy, how much easier is it to cut down the tree? Much easier. How do you eat the elephant? Okay. So that means then you don't need to come up with the perfect viral post. Probably what you need to do is actually think about the things that are keeping your people up at night. It has something to do with sin. Being sinned against or being a sinner. Guilt and shame, very powerful. We have an answer to that the world doesn't. You realize that. They can take guilt and they can try and pass it along. It's not really my fault, but it's yours. They can take shame and try and like compact it down until it doesn't bother you anymore and we're just going to call it pride anyway. Um, but as it turns out, like we, we've, we've done this math. 
Like the world has done this thing with, with, with shame and pride, but they're still committing suicide at an increasing rate. It's not working for them. You have hope. Lean on that. You have hope that is Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins. You have hope that is a new identity that you are worthy of love and that your, your, your personhood is more than just that one aspect of you. The reason that Christians don't want to identify by their sin isn't because we're trying to be better people. It's because that thing is crushing me, so I want to be known by something helping me. I'm known by Jesus. Let the gospel be the part of every post that you do. And then you get to recognize what preparation really means. It's not simply lighting. It's not simply algorithm. But it's hope. It's truth. It's joy. Spend the first four hours actually thinking about what you're going to say and why Jesus dying on a cross actually matters for these people. And if you can't answer that, you shouldn't be posting right now. When you actually find the meaning behind this stuff, the, the, the purpose of the gospel, that's going to carry over. It, it really will, it will bring with it authenticity. It will bring with it hope that gathers in more hope. And it will never, ever, ever sell as much as sex. And God be praised for it. Because that is vapid. I know it's vapid. Because you guys, they, they went to Pornhub yesterday. Why are they back on there again? It didn't satisfy. We have the thing that continues to fill up a cup over and over again, no matter how many times we empty it. And so if it be a little bit or a lot, God be praised for it. Because in all of it, in all of it, the Lord has promised to work to point you to a place where that hope is delivered in in ways that you can touch, taste, and interact with. Um, I'll do my best to answer the questions that you have, but I'm going to end a little bit early and be respectful of your time as well. Thank you guys so much.